I'm Bart Langland, call sign TMAT, and I'm here to introduce my friend, uh, the guest speaker this morning, uh, John Parker, call sign Spidey. Uh, Spidey is a uh, combat veteran fighter pilot, uh, retired after 24 years as a colonel, a couple of master's degrees, went on, flew for the airlines for a while, till he took over pretty much all the F-35 program out at Luke Air Force Base. And then after several years there, transitioned over to be a, an F-35 instructor pilot where he works right now. What you really need to know about Spidey is uh, he's a husband, uh, he's a father, and he's a believer. Uh, he wrote a book, If Jesus Were a Fighter Pilot, and he's gonna talk about that for us today. And um, he founded 9G Ministries, which gives him an opportunity to go out and speak like uh, he's gonna be doing this morning. Would you please welcome Spidey Parker? There's never a person that, that's call sign goes the best as TMAT, because it stands for tall man always talking. And if you had a chance to actually just shake his hand and have a conversation with him, you will understand. Just a, a great person, and I am, I'm so glad that we are getting to work together now as contract instructor pilots. That's what we do right now for Luke. So we don't get to fly the jet anymore, unfortunately, but we do all the academic instruction, and we also do all the simulator instruction. So we teach the young kids coming up, all the gray hairs that are there, and uh, I get to work with uh, Team Ad every day, and it's been a blessing. Uh, first, I'd like to start out and say uh, thank you to Ted and the whole ISI team uh, for the opportunity to speak today. You know, it's definitely a privilege for me uh, to stand before you and share God's word. And as you just heard from Bart, I had the distinct honor of serving in the U.S. Air Force for over 24 years, <clears throat> and most of that time spent as an F-16 pilot. And needless to say, military life brings it with some unique customs and uh, culture, if you would say, and after all that time, I can't help but see the world through that lens. And when I look back at my military experience and reflect on God's word and my Christian faith, I see some surprising similarities. And that's what led me to write the book, What If Jesus Was a Fighter Pilot? It was my attempt to provide that unique experience and perspective in a way that's both fun and informative and hopefully leading others to Christ. And today, I'd just like to share just a little bit of that book. Now, as a fighter pilot, I always heard people say, it must be great to fly fighters. They see the romance and danger that most movies portray, you know, to fly in combat, to defeat the enemy and win the war, like some brave knight charging forth on his mighty steed. Uh, but honestly, there are many, many hours of sheer boredom and drudgery. Uh, when you watch movies like Top Gun, all they show is high G maneuvers, right? Gun footage and flexing on the beach. But they never show, never show the hours and hours of mission planning, of combat readiness exercise, or days when you're just stuck in the weather, right? I had a total of four flying tours in northern Japan and Korea, and the weather there was always snowing or rainy or fog or hazy. There were months where you didn't see anything but clouds, just cold, gray, and dreary. That's why I live in Arizona, by the way. <laughs> Pilots call this weather the milk bowl, just milky white in every direction. No discernible horizon, just a complete white haze. So thank the juror at pilot training and your learning to fly instruments. This is the process of navigating and landing your aircraft just solely by the displays in your cockpit. Training begins with simulators, but then quickly progresses to the jet. And the jet training aircraft have two seats. Normally, the student sits up front with the instructor behind. However, in this case, you get to fly from the back seat because here they have a curtain, affectionately known as the bag, that pulls forward and obscures your vision of the outside. The instructor sits up front and monitors your progress. You will spend hours under the bag learning to control your jet without any visual cues of the outside. Tons of fun. I hope you don't get any motion sickness. One of the first things they teach you to do is to tune, identify, and monitor your navigational aids. The jet receives radio signals from various stations on the ground, and these stations provide the information you require to safely navigate your jet in the weather. Just like the radio in your car, you must first set or tune the appropriate frequency of the navigational aid. 
the station will transmit a signal in Morse code that's the same as its name. This is called the identifier. For example, Luke Air Force Base station name is L-U-F. It stands for Luke Field. It is identified by the Morse code dots and dashes that match those letters, L-U-F. Literally, dee, 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 <laughs> You didn't think you were going to learn Morse code this morning, did you? There might be a test later. But you must continually listen to this and monitor the identifier to ensure the signal does not go off air. We must tune, identify, and monitor. Monitor jets do this normally and automatically. They will display the station's, <coughs> station's name once it hears and identifies that code. As a simulator instructor, I routinely see pilots fail in this basic requirement. They tune in the frequency, right? But they never verify that it's available and accurate. And this can lead to some interesting developments, right? A benign instrument approach can turn into a life-threatening situation. Unfortunately, we've had fighter pilots successfully fly a combat mission only to lose their life in the final approach and landing. The cause is always the same, spatial disorientation, better known as spatial D. They lose their situational awareness in the weather and then hit the ground or something attached to it. Consider how we interact with the world. Sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Sight has by far the most important input to our worldly awareness. You take it away and our body falls back on other inputs. Now imagine you're on a roller coaster wearing a blindfold, right? We don't maneuver that aggressively in the weather, but you can quickly feel that you're turning or descending when you're not. That's why we are taught to trust our instruments. Your body might feel like it's a turn, but your instruments are telling you that you're straight and level. This is what leads to spatial disorientation. All pilots who've ever flown in the weather has experienced this. The feeling that up is not up. I flew an F-16 straight and level in the weather and felt like I was upside down. It's a very difficult sensation to explain. All you want to do is what feels right, but your instruments are telling you no. The pilots call this the leans because it feels like you're leaning, and sometimes this feeling can be overwhelming. It's all you can do not to roll the jet. Funny thing is, this feeling instantly goes away once you break out of the weather and you see your true attitude. It's important to always trust your instruments. Now, my first car was a 1970 Camaro, royal blue with a 307 horsepower V8 engine. Just barely touched the gas, and you're going well over 70 miles an hour. I am just 16 years old, and my dad casually brings it home one day. Totally awesome car, uh, but what was he thinking, right? Who gives a teenager a car with a V8, no airbags, right, and barely functioning seatbelts? He did. Best gift ever. The one thing I remember about that car, other than the speed, was the radio. It had an old-school AM, FM analog tuner with a cassette, right? Just move the dial a sixteenth of an inch, and you'd rock it through three radio stations. Driving down the road and hit a bump, the dial would move, and all you would hear was static. I was constantly having to retune that radio. It's important to note that radio waves are a type of electromagnetic radiation, or EM radiation. This includes everything from visible light, right, infrared, and microwaves. These invisible waves are everywhere. If you're not tuned in correctly, the resulting EM static you hear is just random EM in the atmosphere. Have you ever thought that all you hear from God is static? That somehow you're not on the right frequency? I believe all Christians experience this. The first step to perceiving God's will and direction in your life is to tune in, right? To get on the right frequency with God. But how? What frequency is God on? The only way, I mean, only way to get on the right frequency with God is to read and meditate on his word. That's why he gave it to us. 
And some people have a problem with the word meditate because they envision random chanting and incense. But the word meditation simply comes the Latin meditatum, which means to concentrate or to ponder. We must read and concentrate on God's word to perceive his will. Joshua 1.8 tells us, Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. When you read God's word, you begin to see the world through his eyes. Your perception changes. The things you value change. You begin to see your true attitude. You know you're on the right frequency when you start to develop a Christ-like character. Romans 12.2 tells us, Do not be conformed by the pattern of this world. We be transformed by the renewing or retuning of your mind. This tuning needs to be done daily, right? Remember, there's a lot of EM static out there. Just like my old Camaro, you could hit a bump and lose the frequency. Unfortunately, you may not just hear static. You may hear another voice. Be warned, 1 Peter 8 tells us that Satan is out there prowling around seeking to devour someone. We must never forget that we're in the midst of a spiritual battle, and deception is Satan's best weapon. Consider this story. There's an old Cherokee Indian teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It's a terrible fight, and it's between two wolves. One is evil. He's anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, lies, pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee just simply replied, the one you feed. You may have heard this story before, but it does help illustrate the battle going on within all of us. We are in a spiritual battle. We struggle with our own sinful nature and Satan's deception. We either submit ourselves to our Father in heaven or by, by following his word, or we by default make Satan our father by giving in to our own sinful desires and valuing the things of this world. We must choose which wolf we feed. We must get on the right frequency. But how do we identify God's will from the rest of the static? How can we ensure we're dialed into the right frequency and avoid being fooled? First, God will never tell you to do something that goes against his word of law, right? His standards of behavior are there for a reason. Just following the law will not make us good, but it must be our first step, our first twist of the dial. If we're not obedient to his word, we will never be on the right frequency and most assuredly get led astray. Now, flying fighters has always been a risky business, and fighter pilots are expected to take risks, even extreme life-threatening risks, if it means the defense of our nation. However, we take great strides to manage that risk, especially during training. We have training rules, or TRs, that help prevent situations that could lead to accidents. These could be altitudes that we shouldn't descend below, or minimum air speeds during simulated fights. If you reach these limits for any reason, you are required to call a knock it off and cease maneuvering. It's been said that training rules are written in blood because at one point it cost somebody their life. You can't be a fighter pilot if you don't follow the training rules, and you can't be a Christian if you don't strive to live a life according to God's word and law. In the Garden of Eden, God only had one law. Do not eat the, tree, uh, <clears throat> do not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Yep, we broke that one almost immediately. In the Old Testament, God called on Moses to lead his people out of bondage in Egypt, and after they escaped, he gave them the Ten Commandments to guide their behavior. Yep, we broke that almost on day one, correct? The Old Testament goes on to stipulate 613 laws, right? From one law to 613, and we just keep breaking them, right? What we learn is that laws do not make us good. But the only way we know we're not good is because we fail to follow God's laws. It's been said that the law is a mirror that shows us who we are, sinners. And the only, way, only when we accept that fact that we've all fallen short can we turn to Jesus. 
This is what it means to identify, to make sure you're on the right frequency with God. You must filter out or ignore the bad signals that are trying to lead you astray. You can only identify false doctrine and deception by understanding God's word. You must identify God's true voice. Value only Christ's righteousness. Avoid feeding the bad wolf. As a father, I'm a terrible disciplinarian. I was constantly letting my kids off the hook when they were younger. But it gave me a great perspective. I realized I didn't want my kids to blindly follow my rules. I didn't want to ground them or take their stuff just to make them obey, right? I wanted them, what I wanted them was for them to trust me and do what I asked, right, because they love me. I wanted them to know that if there was a rule, it was there for their benefit. We can never truly legislate morality. We can make endless laws and enforce everyone, but that would not make us good, right? We must be reborn. We must have a change of heart. When our love for God drives our behavior, we will be on the right path. This is why Jesus disliked the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, 27, he called them whitewashed tombs, right? Which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. The Pharisee only cared about how they looked to other people, not about what was going on in their heart. But this world is full of so much static, right? So many voices vying for our attention. Deception lurks around every corner. How can we ever hope to win? But God, he has already given us his greatest weapon, a way to make sure we are always in connection with him. Prayer. The best way to stay connected with God, to make sure we never lose the signal, is through prayer. Many people are confused what it is to pray. Again, they visualize incense burning, mumbled chanting, and complicated rituals. But prayer is nothing more than thinking, speaking, and reflecting on God and His Word. Prayer is just talking with God. We have direct access because of Christ's sacrifice. In Matthew 27, 51, it states, When Christ died on the cross, the veil in the Jerusalem temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The veil was a heavy curtain that separated a room called the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. The Holy of Holies contained the spirit of the Lord, and Levite priests could only enter once a year. But through Christ's sacrifice, we are redeemed in the eyes of God and now have direct access to Him. The veil is torn. The barrier forever removed. Prayer is the closest we will come to God in this life. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, to have our minds always on the things of God, to have a continuous conversation with God. This is what it means to monitor. Many of us, including myself, do not take advantage of this enormous opportunity. We fail to monitor and lose the frequency. We go through life without any navigational aids. Just like a father wanting to talk to his children, God wants a relationship with us. To pray is to stay continuously connected with God. Don't miss this. God created everyone to be in relationship with Him. We cannot function any other way. We must continually monitor our risks being led astray. And God has already shown us how to pray. In Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13, when asked how we should pray, Jesus responded with the Lord's Prayer. Let's take a look. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This speaks to God's sovereignty, right? His absolute authority. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He has a plan to bring his family back together, and it will not fail. Our actions must be aligned to his will. Give us today our daily bread, right? He knows what we need, and we need to acknowledge that all good things come from him. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He is the Almighty. We need to draw close to Him for forgiveness and protection. And finally, this should be used to frame our prayers, not just blindly spoken. The best prayers always come from the heart. You must realize we were never meant to do this on our own. Jesus is called the Good Shepherd because He oversees a flock of followers. His family is called the church. Many believe church is just something you do on Sundays. 
But it's much more than that. It's your eternal family, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And family support and defend each other, and it's just the same as your Christian family. In Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12, it says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. In God's family, we are joined together and we support each other. We are not easily broken. Many in the secular or non-religious worlds believe the comment, I will pray for you, as an insult. They see no value in it. Truthfully, there's nothing more valuable or effective. From the seed of prayer, everything good grows. The more we pray and reflect on God's word, the more our life becomes kingdom-focused, the more we are tuned in to his will. Prayer drives our spiritual life just as food and sleep impacts our physical life. This mindset casts out all doubts and fears concerning our life on earth and beyond, and the only thing that remains is peace. Prayer produces lasting peace. We must tune, identify, and monitor. To tune, to read and meditate on God's word, to be transformed by the retuning of our mind, to develop kingdom eyes that see our true attitude. We must tune in or we risk getting spatial D in the milk bowl of this world. To identify, we must hear God's true voice by striving to live according to his word and never forget that there's an enemy and deception is his greatest weapon. Remember, God loves us and his law is there for our benefit. We must trust our instruments, follow the training rules, avoid feeding the bad wolf. And finally, to monitor to pray without ceasing. We are designed to be in constant connection with God. Christ's sacrifice split the veil. Without God, we go through life without any navigational aids. We must follow the Good Shepherd and come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to be his church, his family, children of God. Now, I just have three questions for you. Maybe is what are we collectively and individually doing to tune, identify, and monitor? How are we staying in God's Word, right? Do we have a plan every day to be in the Word? How do we identify? What are we doing actively to follow His Word and law? What challenges do you have? Share that with your brothers here today. And finally, to monitor our prayer life, to pray without ceasing, do you even think that's possible? Can someone actually do that? You know, how do we stay connected with God at all times? To monitor is extremely important because if you fail to do that, you will lose the frequency and go through life without any guidance. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. It's been an honor and privilege. We'll just bow our hearts, hearts and uh, minds in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this message that John Parker brought, uh, these principles, timeless principles that are in the Bible and how they linked to his experiences. Um, we pray that your spirit be on our hearts and convict us of these things, and we look forward to a small group discussions now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, John Parker. I'd like to um, just acknowledge the, the new... Uh, First time attendees here, there's about five. If you could just raise your hand and we just want to acknowledge you and thank you for joining us this morning. There's a few over here, one over here, over here. It's, it's outstanding that uh, you men are seeking to, to look to invite others here and with the t-shirts and hats and wristbands and cards we've got, it's a, it takes the, some of the, the burden off you. Just, just share what uh, people might approach you about and ask you, what is that ISI? mean and uh, it gives you a good opportunity to invite people here so thanks for that. Thank